share the message today. Amen. Thank you, Charlene. Happy Father's Day to all the dads and spiritual dads and father figures and men in the place today. Um, let me just say, you have what it takes. You have what it takes to do what God's called you to do. I know lots of times it doesn't feel like you do. Whether you're leading your, your own children or different men, uh, people God's brought into your life, he's anointed you to be a father, to walk with other young men and young women and to love them. So I just want to remind you of that this morning. You have what it takes. All the men say, I have what it takes. Oh. <laughs> I knew you didn't believe it. Say, I have what it takes. Amen. Because you're filled with the Spirit of God. And God's called you and He's anointed you. And um, so, yeah, you have what it takes. I'll just say real quick, next week we are doing this community event, and Charlene just mentioned it, but there's invitations on your seats and at the back. If you remember, we did this in March, and we had 250 people here. It was packed. And um, we're doing this again, and we're going to have a meal, and we're going to be around tables. But you can invite your friends and family to come out to this. We're going to share the good news. We're not, we try our best not to embarrass you in front of your friends, okay? You bring them. We're going to show an alpha video. And um, it's just such a great opportunity. So many people need to hear the good news. They need to hear about Jesus. So why don't you each take at least one and pray about, God, who could I invite? You know, we left the, black, the, the back blank. You could even write a little message to them. Just welcome them. Uh, you could say we could go together or we could meet at the doors. Um, but I encourage you each to take at least one and to invite one person to come uh, next week. Uh, we also have the playground rented for the kids outside. So that's another, another draw for families. If you want to tell them that, they can come and the kids get to play on the playground outside. So that's next week. So happy Father's Day. This morning I want to talk about the Father's heart. The Father's heart. Everyone say, the Father's heart. You know, God is, is the ultimate Father. He is the Father of all life. He's our Father. Uh, he sent His Son to die in our place. And so this morning I want, to, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the Father's heart. And what is the Father's heart towards us? And his, his plans and His purposes for us. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read a story from the Scripture that perhaps some of you are familiar with. Perhaps you haven't heard it before. And so I'm actually going to read a few more verses than I would normally read on a Sunday morning because it's, it's a story. And so I want to read this story. And the story is often referred to as the prodigal son. But really this story, often we focus on, on the son, really this story is about the father. And so on Father's Day, I thought it'd be fitting to read this story. And then I want to pull a couple things out about the father's heart and ultimately the father's heart towards you. Because how many know we're, we're all children of God? Whether you're a believer or a Christian this morning or not, you're a child of God. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn to chap Luke chapter 15. It's also going to be on the screen for you. Luke chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 11 to 32. Verse 11 to 32. And it says this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. Every good dad knows how to tell a good story, right? And none of you embellish. I know that, right? It's, there's something about a story that brings across truth in a way. And here's Jesus speaking. He said, a man had two sons. And the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. How many dads would, would be excited to hear that from your son? 
This is what the son says to the father. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger." I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you, against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring and put it on his finger, sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine which was dead has now returned to life he was lost but now he is found so the party began meanwhile the older son was in the fields working when he returned home he heard music and dancing in the house and he asked one of the servants what was going on your brother's back He was told, your father has killed the fattened calf and we're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that every bit of your word reveals a piece of your heart. It teaches us something about you, Lord. And so today on Father's Day, we welcome you, Father. We welcome you here to be with us. We welcome you to teach us, to lead us, to encourage us, to lift us up. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So perhaps you've heard that story before, or maybe that's the first time you heard it. And in this story, there's a lot going on. Now, I got to give you a little bit of context of the story to understand how Jesus is speaking and why he's speaking the way he's speaking. The very beginning of Luke chapter 15 says that Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors and notorious sinners. That's how the chapter opens. Other translations say, say well-known sinners. And so Jesus is, is hanging out with tax collectors and notorious sinners. And in the culture of the day, the Jews lived under the oppression of, of the Romans. They, they were living in Israel, but the Romans controlled the area, and they set up government over the Jews. And they had recruited Jews to collect tax for them. And so if you were a Jewish tax collector, (laughs) can someone say a tax collector? There we go. 
Your brothers and sisters did not like you very much because you were working for the enemy. You were collecting tax for a government that was suppressing you and keeping you poor. And so if, you, if that was your profession, your fellow countrymen, they didn't like you very much. In fact, they, they looked down on you. And so the context of this story, context is always really important in the scripture. We understand what's happening. Is Jesus is hanging out with these people. He's hanging out with the people that others don't want to hang out with. And the Pharisees, in the very next verse, come, who are like the religious leaders of the day. It says the Pharisees and the scribes. They, they come to Jesus and they start complaining to Jesus, saying, why are you hanging out with these notorious sinners? Why are you hanging out with these people? This doesn't look very good. You know, us as religious people, we, we stay away from them. We wouldn't be caught dead hanging out with these people. And so Jesus says to them, he says, well, let me tell you a story. And often in the scripture, this is how Jesus will speak when he's asked a question. And he tells them three stories in, an order, in order. The one we read is the third story and the longest. The first story he tells them is about a farmer or a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. And he loses one of those sheep. And because he's lost that one sheep, he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. And then he tells a story about a woman who had 10 silver coins. And how she loses one of those silver coins. And how she goes and she, she searches her whole house and she looks in every corner until she can find the one silver coin. And then she has a party and she celebrates because she's found this lost coin. And then he goes on to tell this longer story that we just read about the father and his two sons. And so if we include the context of this story and we look at this a little bit closer, one of the levels that Jesus is speaking on here, and of course, you know, Scripture's alive. You know that? If you've ever read through the Bible more than once, you know this because you'll read it once and it speaks to you and it does something, but you read it again and you get something totally different out of it the next time and then the next time and then the next time because these aren't just written words of history. These are words of God. The Bible says they're alive and they're active. And so one of the things that's actually going on here is Jesus is actually including his audience in the story. Think about it. The tax collector and the sinner is actually the younger brother. And the older brother is the Pharisees and the scribes. So they're asking him a question and he's actually telling a story and including them in the story. Jesus actually does this quite often when you go and read his stories. And sometimes the Pharisees pick up on it, and other times I think it kind of goes right over their head. They don't understand what he's saying. And so he's actually telling them a story about them, and actually it's a story about us. It's a story about mankind. It's a story about all of us, and in the story, the Father is God. And so the father is God, the younger brother is a human, someone who's strayed from God, who's walked away from God. And the older brother is, is a religious person, is someone who's been with God for a long time. And, and so the context is important here. You know, the context is, is always so important. And the Pharisees, See, the Pharisees, one of the thing about, thing about the Pharisees when you read about them, they're the, they're the Jewish religious leaders of the day. They understood the Father's words really well. They knew the Old Testament. In fact, most of them could quote the first five books of the Bible. They were trained so deeply in this. See, they knew the Father's words really well, but they didn't understand the Father's heart. You know there's a difference, Right? You can, you can understand the words that are coming from someone, but if you miss the heart in which 
they're saying it, you can take it totally wrong. Have you ever experienced that before? Have you ever got a text before? I think text probably illustrates this perfectly. You ever got a text from someone and, and you just you think it's a really bad situation? I got a text a few weeks ago from, from someone I know. Um, they don't live in Regina. I hadn't talked to them in a little while. I got a text from them, and I read the text, and I thought, oh, no, this person's really mad at me. Has this ever happened to you before? Um, I, because it's just words, right? There's, unless they're using a lot of emojis. I don't know if you're an emoji texter or a lot of capitals or punctuation. You can totally read into the text and, and think that it's meaning one thing. Well, two days later, I end up having a phone call with this person and end up realizing I totally took the message the wrong way. They were totally loving towards me. We had a fantastic conversation. By the end of it, we're praying together, and, and it was actually quite beautiful. And sometimes we can hear the words of someone and not really get the heart of it. And, I, and the Pharisees, they really struggled with this. The Jews in this time were really struggling with this. They, they read the scripture, but at times they struggled to connect with the Father's heart. This is why they rejected Jesus, because they anticipated Jesus was going to come in a certain way. They anticipated he was going to look a certain way, but he looked totally different. Why is he hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? You know, I think sometimes we, we actually still do this. We expect God to move in a certain way. We expect him to speak to us in a certain way. We expect him to do something in a certain way. And when he does it in a different way than we expect, we sometimes miss it or we're confused or hurt or disappointed. Anyone? And so it's so important that we understand the Father's heart. We must understand his words. We must understand what he's saying to us. But we need to understand the heart of the Father. Because the heart of the Father is for you. The heart of the Father, the Father loves you. The Father, he he so deeply loves you and has a plan for you. He's not angry with you. He's a good Father. He's a loving father. He's a caring father. He's a gracious father. He's a peaceful father. He does correct us when we need to be corrected. And he does discipline us when we need to be disciplined. But it's because he loves us. He's a good father. And so I want to look at this story of the prodigal son and pull out three things that I see in this story about the father's heart that I hope that you can take note of here on Father's Day and take with you. It's great to celebrate the fathers, and we celebrate all of you. We have a little gift for all the adult men as you leave here today, um, a Tim Hortons card, and it's just for you to go and buy yourself a coffee and a donut or whatever you get from Tim Hortons, just for you to enjoy today. We want to bless the fathers, but I also want to remind you that, that you have a good father. You have a good father. And so I want to point out three things in this story about the Father's heart. Are you with me today? Yes? Everyone else, are you with me today? Do we need to stand up and do 10 jumping jacks or something? We're good. So number one, one of the things that I see in this story that's on the Father's heart is the Father is for a relationship. The Father, and I'm talking about Father God, and hopefully a good father on earth models this. The father is for relationship. Look at Luke chapter 15. We just read verse 24. It says this, after the son has returned, he says, we must celebrate with a feast. I love that language, right? It's not like we should or I want to. He says, we must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine. Notice the identity piece. It's not this boy who's wasted all my money. This boy who's done horrible things. This boy who's shamed the family name. That's not his language. He says, this son of mine. This son of... this. Take these words for yourself this morning. This son of mine. This daughter of mine. Was dead. 
and has now returned to life. Was lost, but is now found. The Father's heart is for relationship. The Son was reluctant to come back to the Father because he didn't know how he would find his dad. He didn't know that he could still be his son. In fact, he reasoned with him himself, perhaps I could just be a servant. Perhaps I could just be a slave. But when he comes, the father has none of that. You're my son. And the father's heart is always for relationship. But look at this. It's not for just relationship with the younger son. It's also for relationship with the older son. Some of you here this morning might relate more with the older son than you do the younger son. Maybe you've been in church your whole life. Maybe you've served God and we all make mistakes, but you've walked with him closely and you've read his word and you've served him and you watch people coming into the church, coming and getting saved. And perhaps at times you feel actually a little bit more like the older brother. Like, God, I've been walking with you all these years. But listen, when the older brother refuses to come in because he's angry, he's upset with the younger brother, right? Kind of a natural, you can kind of understand his feelings, right? I can as, as an older brother. I have a younger brother. I can kind of understand that, yeah, you know, he deserves to be disciplined. But listen to what the father says to him in verse 28. It says the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father, what, came out to him. His father came out and begged him. Begged him to come in. Can I encourage you this morning? The father wants you. His heart is for you. His heart is for relationship with you. Some of you came in here this morning not knowing if God really loves you. Not knowing if God would actually want to spend time with you. Not knowing if he just puts up with you or he actually cares for you. Can I tell you this morning, whether you're a younger brother or an older brother or somewhere in between, God wants to be with you. He wants to be in relationship with you. And any dad in this place, you know, who's in a, in a decent state of mind will say, I want to be with my kids. I want to be with my kids. I want to be with them. I want to spend time with them. You know, my wife doesn't like when I answer questions like this. And I don't know if you know about the five love languages. You know, there's the five love languages, the five ways we all receive and give love. For me, gifts is the least. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a huge... I, I mean, I like getting a gift. Don't get me wrong. I like receiving a gift. But it's not one of the... It's, for me, it's the lowest on the scale of how I receive love. So whenever the kids or Monica ask me, what do you want for your birthday? What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Father's Day? I always say, I just want all my family together. And they're always like, yeah, but what do you actually want, right? And I'm like, no, seriously. I don't know if other dads can echo that here this morning. I, I'm like, seriously, that's what I want. I just want my family together. I'd like to see my dad and my grandpa, which I get to see this afternoon. I'm excited about that. And this is just a fraction of the Father, Father God's heart for us. He just wants his kids together. He just, he just wants to be with you. He just wants relationship with you. And if there's any disconnect in that relationship or thoughts of maybe the Father doesn't want me to be a son, you know, maybe I could be a slave or a servant, but a son, I've done too much. Can I tell you, those are the thoughts of the enemy. Those are not the thoughts of the Father. The, Bi the Bible tells us when the son was on his way back, well, he was still a long way off. The Father saw him and came running. The Father came to him. He began moving, but the Father came to him. And God's heart is for relationship. Amen? Everyone say, God wants to be with me. He does. Number two, the second thing I see in this story that's on the Father's heart is He wants to give good gifts. 
The Father wants to give his children good gifts. He wants to give you good gifts. You don't have to punish yourself all the time. You can receive a good gift from the Father. Look at verse 12 in Luke 15. It says, The younger son told his father, this is before he leaves, I want my share of your estate now before you die. I just read that and think, you entitled little boy. (laughs) Right? But the father's response is almost shocking. He gives it to him. He gives him the share of his inheritance. But read it a little bit closer. Does he just give it to the younger son? No, it says, so the father agreed to divide his wealth. He gave it to both of them. That's kind of interesting when you read later on in the story that the older son kind of missed it. Because actually at this point, he divides his wealth amongst his kids. And remember I told you this is a story about us. We're the kids and God's the father. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, you know, he divided his wealth amongst his children. Except our inheritance isn't physical things. It's not money or wealth. Those are gifts God gives. He will give us physical gifts. But you know, the inheritance that he unleashed and that he made available to all the children of God was his presence. Because remember point one, his heart is to be with you. And when Jesus died on the cross, he divided his wealth amongst his children. He released the Holy Spirit. He released the Holy Spirit into the world that we may receive him and that we may have our full inheritance as his children. The scripture says he's adopted you and he's adopted me and we are his heirs. We are his heirs, and we have the full inheritance. Notice that the father, when the son asked, divided his wealth. He divided the inheritance, and he gave it to both sons. God desires to give you good gifts. Everyone say, God wants to give me a gift. Some people aren't very good at receiving gifts. Maybe for different reasons. Can you just receive the gifts God wants to give to you? This is on the Father's heart. He wants to give you good gifts. He's a good Father who gives good gifts. Look at Luke chapter 11, just back four chapters, verse 11 to 13. Should be on the screen. It says, You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God loves to give good gifts, and he loves to give you his Holy Spirit. And when he gives you his Holy Spirit, he gives you strength. He gives you power. He gives you power over sin. He gives you boldness. He gives you courage to live the life He's called you to live. Amen? This is our inheritance. We're His children. And He already died and came back to life. And He's given it to us. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 32. I just think this is a awesome verse it says so don't be afraid little flock he's talking to us for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom say it again say god wants to give me a gift amen It's on his heart. This is the Father's heart for us here this morning. So number one, the Father's heart is for relationship. Number two, it's on the Father's heart to give us good gifts. 
And number three, it's on the Father's heart for his children to be in unity. It's on the Father's heart for us as brothers and sisters in Christ to be in unity. It really is. This is his desire. Look at verse 29 to 32. We already read it, but let's read it again. He replied, all these years, this is the older brother speaking, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me more than one young goat. Just stop for a second, right? We know from reading previous, the older brother has missed it, right? He's completely missed it. The wealth had already been divided. And from what the father's about to say, he's missing it. It's already his. It's already all his. He says, you never once gave a young goat for a feast with my friends. Listen to his language here. Yet when this son of yours, notice his language, this isn't my brother. (laughs) Has anyone ever felt like this with your brother? You don't have to put up your hand, right? It's like, this son of yours, dad, you're going to have to deal with this guy because I don't want anything to, that's his language. He doesn't want anything to do with him. He's ashamed of him. He's angry with him. He's upset with him. He, he, he's judging him. And he says, this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes? And you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? Now listen to the father's language. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. Listen, we had to celebrate this happy day for what? For your brother. He doesn't say, My son. I think he's directly responding to the brothers saying, This son of yours. And the father responds and says, your brother. Your brother. You know, when Cain killed Abel, Adam and Eve's two boys, right? They, they, Cain was upset because God didn't accept his offering, but he accepted Abel's, and he killed him. And God came to him and said, where is your brother? And what does he say to him? He says, I'm not my brother's keeper, Right? That's what he says to him. I'm not my brother's keeper. I don't know where my brother... That's totally a brother thing to say, right? It's just like, I don't know where my brother is. That's not my problem. But you know what God's saying? He's saying, you are your brother's keeper. Actually. (laughs) You are your brother's keeper. You should care for your brother. You should care for your sister. You should care for your family. And when he says to him, this son of yours, God responds and says, this brother of yours. This brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. See, sin drives a wedge between you and me. It first drives a wedge between us and God. But when that bridge is built between us and God because of His grace, He comes running to us, He accepts us back, He forgives us of all our sin, He calls us son or daughter, that's restored. But there also needs to be a restoration between brother and sister, brother and brother, sister and sister. And sin, it drives a wedge between us. It drives a wedge between you and I. And if we're not careful, we can begin to fall into judgmental thinking or looking down on one another. But God looks at us and he says, this is your brother. This is your sister. God's grace brings us together. Amen? It brings us together as families. It brings us together as a church. Last weekend, it brought the city of Regina together as multiple churches and unbelievers 
gathering at Mosaic Stadium. The grace of God brings unity. And can I tell you this morning, it's on the Father's heart for there to be unity in his people. Unity in his sons and daughters. Can I encourage you this morning? If, if you're in a difficult situation with a brother or sister, can I encourage you to begin praying about that? And begin giving that to God. And maybe right now you feel like saying to God, this son of yours, this daughter of yours, you know what, that's okay. God doesn't rebuke the older brother. He doesn't push him away. He just welcomes him into relationship. He says, no, he's your brother. Can I encourage you this morning, if you're you're in a battle with another human being, especially another believer, but really anyone, maybe a family member, can I encourage you this morning to start taking that to God because it's on his heart that that relationship would be restored. That you with your brother and your sister would walk in unity. That you would find peace and forgiveness and joy. Amen? Can you receive that this morning? It's on the Father's heart for his children to be in unity. And so this morning... Actually, I was going to share one other thing with that piece, with unity. Whenever Monica or the kids ask me, what do you want for Father's Day or your birthday or Christmas, I always follow it up with a second thing. I always say, I want my whole family together. And what's the second part, Caleb? (laughs) Clearly, I don't say it enough. And I don't want anyone to fight. (laughs) That's what I always say. I say, I want everyone together together. And I don't want anyone to fight. Sometimes that's a big ask. But you know, I think that's on the Father's heart as well. I just want everyone to come together, and I don't want anyone to fight. As a father, I just, I would just love to sit back. I got a nice, comfy chair in our living room. It's actually Monica's chair, but I try to take it whenever I can because it's very comfortable. You know, And I just would like to sit there and just have my family and everyone's getting along. This is the Father's heart for his children, is that we would be in unity, that we'd receive the good gifts he wants to give to us, and that we'd be in relationship with him, walking with him. And so on Father's Day today, can you receive this this morning? The Father loves you. He loves you. He wants to be with you. Some of you might need to write that down and say it every day. God wants to be with me. Because you might need healing in that area. You might not actually feel like he wants to be with you. He wants to be with you. Others might need to write down the second part and say it over yourself. God wants to give me good gifts. He wants to bless me. He wants to give me good gifts. And maybe others, you need to focus on the third point. God wants me to love my brothers and sisters and to be in unity with them. Amen? And so the Father is here this morning. He loves you. He wants to give you good gifts. And he wants to work on your relationships with each other. So would you stand with me this morning as we go back into worship? I'm going to pray. And I just want to pray that we would receive the Father's heart this morning. That we would receive a fresh anointing, a fresh filling of the Father's heart towards us. Just like the Son coming back to the Father, we would just return our hearts to the Father God. Whether we've been slaving in the fields, and maybe we've lost connection with the Father, or we've been far off. This morning, if you've been far off from the Father, come running back. Come running back, and he's going to come running to you. Can we close our eyes? So God, this morning, we welcome you. Father God, we welcome you to come and to give us a fresh revelation of your heart. God, we're sorry for when we've been far. 
when we've rejected you, when we've thought you were an angry God, when we've thought you were an angry Father, Lord, when we've shut you out, when we've disrespected you, Lord, we're sorry. God, we know that's not your heart. And so, Lord, I ask for a fresh revelation of the Father's heart across this room this morning. God, for those that need healing in their hearts, perhaps from a negative experience with an earthly father, God, would you bring healing and would you come and would you be our father this morning? Would you wrap us in your arms of love? Would you hold us close? Would you speak to us and whisper in our ear, Lord, and tell us the things that are on your heart. Tell us the things that you think about us. Show us, Lord, how you see us as your sons and your daughters. Lord, help us to walk in the fullness of your heart towards us this morning. Bless my brothers and sisters here today, Lord. Bless every father in this place. Lord, may they be encouraged this morning to know that they have what it takes to raise their children, to walk with those men you've put in their life. God, to, to reflect the Father's heart to others. Encourage the fathers today, Lord. Lord, we ask today that you would raise up a generation of fathers. A generation of fathers to lead your children into your heart. This morning, if you're under the age of 18 and you're, you're a young man this morning, I actually just feel this on my heart right now. I just want to pray over you. If you're a young man under the age of 18, I just, I just pray this over you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, that you would anoint these young men with the Father's heart. God, that you would anoint these young men right now. Actually, I'm going to... Um, up it to include all our young men. Maybe you're not married yet. Maybe you don't have kids yet. Lord, would you anoint these young men right now with a father's heart, Lord, that they would be a generation of fathers, Lord, that would rise up to love their children, to raise their children, displaying the father heart of God to a whole generation, Lord. We declare over these young men that they will have children, that they will be fathers, Lord, and that they will seek you first in your kingdom. Kingdom, Lord. God, that you would heal their hearts and that they would be godly men of, men of God that would walk in your heart. Even now, Lord, just stir it up in these young men's heart. Stir it up in their hearts, Lord, to be godly men. And can I just say to you, young guys here this morning, it might not be the popular thing to say to your friends, you know, I want to get married and have kids and be a good father. They might sing, what kind of dream is that? You know, young guys, we don't talk. Can I, can I encourage you? That's a dream from God, and you hold on to that, and you take that, and you run with that, because God's putting on your heart, even now as a young man, to be a godly father, to be a father. Blessed is the young man, the scripture says, whose quiver is full, who has children. And can I encourage you, young men here this morning, you know, and God, God gives children in many different ways. Allow God to birth that dream in you, to be a father. That's a good dream to have. That's a good dream to have. So Lord, bless all the fathers this morning. I also just want to pray this. Lord, where there's broken relationships between fathers and their children. Lord, this morning, if that's you this morning, just turn your heart towards God. Lord, where there's broken relationships between fathers and children, Lord, I ask for a restoration to begin this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come into those situations, that you would heal the hearts of the fathers, and you'd heal the hearts of the children, and Lord, you would restore the relationships of the broken father-children relationships in this place this morning. Lord, where there's grieving and where there's brokenness, I ask, Holy Spirit, for you to come and to begin to bring healing and mending to those relationships. God, I even ask for, for hope to rise in the hearts of the fathers that it's not too late there's so much more to do so Lord bless those today bless each and every person in this place today we pray reveal your father's heart to us in Jesus name and everyone said amen
Amen. I'll invite our worship, Kelly and Olivia, if you guys want to come up. And uh, we're just going to go right into a time of worship together. I just encourage you to worship your father this morning. You know, some people often wonder, why do you raise your hands? You know, there's a number of reasons why we do. One of them is just like a young, a young toddler, a young child. We're raising our hands to our father. We're reaching up to him. So let's just reach up and worship the Father this morning. God bless you.